New Church, okay, I'm on. All right. I'm wired, so I'm not quite sure what I'm coming up with. Um, tell me, Peter, it, it, it seems like this is a sort of second home. I've been here a lot over the years. I know a few of you, but there always is a new group, so I only really know the group that's gone rather than the group that's here now. But it's great to be here and, and uh, enjoy it. My, uh, I, some of you, I think, will uh, have my son talk about Australia. Peter called me up and said, don't talk about Australia. They heard it all. Talk about the memorial. Well, it's kind of funny because the memorial finished when we were down at the opening in Australia. And we got a wire from the project manager in New York. And he said, we planted the last tree. And after 15 years, this project is done. And it was the day we opened the, the park in Sydney. And we all went out and had a drink because that, that's the longest project I think we've ever had. So let me talk to you about what we're going to do tonight. Um, what I first say about New York, that's ever happened in the world. In fact, worse things are happening right now in the world. Um, but it was the first time in modern history that the United States had had something like this happen on its soil. And the shock of that. But even more than that, um, this was all on television. And so everybody saw that, and they're still playing it saw that first plane, and then saw the second plane, and then saw just unbelievably these buildings came down. And you can see, actually something that I didn't see, is that was what it was like right after they kind of took out the big stuff, but it was still smoking, it was still dangerous. You couldn't go down to uh, downtown in New York. And I never really saw this, this is just a picture we have. When I first saw it, which was several years later, it looked like this. And they cleaned it out. Uh, the smoke was gone, the particulate, which is dangerous, as I say. And they pretty much repaired the buildings around it. And they were starting to build a new building here. That was the first building they called Building 7. That uh, was the first one up. The governor and the new mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, were determined that this was going to be, this thing was going to jump in the air. It was going to jump right back up and start living again. Um, but it took a long time to accomplish. I first heard about it. I, I entered the competition and we didn't do anything. We didn't hear uh, any, we didn't have to a place. And one day, a young architect, my Michael Rod called me up on the phone and said he was one of eight finalists in the uh, in the competition. The competition by then had been going on six or seven months. The jury was very studious. They sat for over a year. But about six months in, they had picked the first eight people. I'd seen the photographs of the competition, the eight were published. Um, and it was on the website. But I didn't know which scheme Michael Rod, you know, had authored. So I told him, well, this is a big project. I have to talk to my partners, and I'll call you back tomorrow and, and tell you what we think. So immediately I went back, to the, went back to the website and found out that he had probably done the only one of the eight schemes that I think we could have made a real contribution. And the reason was that I collect contemporary art, and I was familiar with Michael Heiser. And as soon as I saw Michael's Arad scheme, I thought of Michael Heiser. This piece is up at Dia Beacon. I've seen it a dozen times. And it's basically a plane with this fairly sizable hole cut in. <laughs> and Michael Arad's idea was to cut a hole, which was the same size and in the same location of the previous buildings. And the idea was that this absence would represent the buildings being gone. We knew that the uh, jury liked this, it was one of the eight. What, we didn't, what I didn't know at that time 
was the violin who was on the jury, and the mayor thought this was the best scheme. But of course, we didn't know it. So I called Michael right back up and I said, we'd love to do this job. This is really a terrific opportunity. Originally, you went down a series of ramps here on each, on each one of the boys, and you went down 30 feet, and at the bottom, the, there's a waterfall around the outside, at the bottom of the waterfall on the inside, and along this little parapet were all the names. So it was like going into a tomb, seeing the names, and then coming up the ramp and coming outside. And the idea there was that you would go into this place of death, and then you would come up, and you would see the sky, and you would be back, you know, in amongst the living. So that was the, that was the basic notion. Now I mentioned that I've been, for some time, collecting modern art, and mostly uh, minimalist art. And one of the artists that I'm most interested in, still are interested, uh, was Carl Andre. And I used to tell my students, you know, this is just an ordinary meadow. As trees around it come pleasant, but his putting this gesture of railroad ties across it. If you walked into this or rode, rode a horse in here or rode a bicycle in here, once you saw this thing with this piece, you'd never forget it. And that really impressed me because clearly it was in a landscape. It was about landscape, but it was done in a way that was so simple and yet so much more powerful than anything that I had ever done. He also did a series of pieces, maybe you know them, they're checkerboards, and they're about an eighth of an inch high. They're not very tall, but they command the space like a great carpet commands the space above it. So even though it has no mats, it's a sculpture of considerable power. And I remember walking into this gallery, this is in Portland, Oregon, and walked in here, and the first thing I noticed is that there was nothing on the wall. There were no paintings. And there was also nothing standing up. There were no sculptures. And then I looked down and saw all these concrete blocks, which is all they are, each with a different pebble, slightly different pebbles set on top. That's all it was. And again, I thought, you know, this is really powerful stuff. You could make a garden this good that simply. I mean, we were used to do 175 pages of working drawings in order to get our gardens made. But if you could do something like this, it would be really wonderful. But I have to tell you that I, at that time, even though I was collecting this stuff, I couldn't connect it. They, they were vaguely garden-esque, but I couldn't connect it, and I couldn't figure out what to do with it. It seemed stupid to me to just put out a checkerboard. I mean, what is that? You, you can see that anywhere. So in the middle 70s, uh, I was taking a group of students from Harvard and uh, uh, Michigan Bill Johnson, who was then Dean of uh, Natural Resources at Michigan, and we'd been classmates at Harvard. And we were taking a group of students. We started down a tour and worked our way up the walk from Chateau to Chateau to Chateau. And one day, I was sitting on the steps. You can see how long ago that was. Uh, I was sitting on the steps and looking out, and I suddenly realized that Leno had figured it out hundreds of years before something that I hadn't been able to figure out. What was it? Basically, he put a plane down. He flattened this plane. And then any goofy thing, you know, like a gumdrop or a little thing or something, a piece of sculpture, anything counted. The minute you made the garden flat, everything on it counted. And that was, if, if I ever did, there should be a little light bulb right there. It just sort of clicked in my head that that was a new idea, at least to me, about gardens, obviously not to Lono. So Martha Schwartz was on that trip, and we went back. We were living in a townhouse in Back Bay, Boston, and um, we had a roof that was leaking. This house was about 18 feet wide and 60 feet long, and we had to put a new roof on it anyway. So we started thinking about our travels and started thinking about how we could make a garden on top of the roof. And we couldn't do a garden with plants, really, but we had to do it, we wanted, we wanted it to be a garden. And, it, and in my mind, anyway, it really needed to be a French garden. 
It ought to have some of that quality, even though it was so small. So I'll just tell you a couple things about it. One of them is that our basan were made with mirrors. And we changed the mirrors once to make them the same proportion as those windows across the way in Back Bay. But what was more important about this one for me is that when the shadow, when the sun threw a shadow across it, it was still reflecting the sky. And it never occurred to me that that could happen and that you could do something like that that phenomenon could be utilized in making gardens. The other thing is that Martha found out that the, you could get flower pots in one inch diameter increments. So if you started with a flower pot here of about 12 inches and you went down to eight inches and then six and then four and then two, you've got a kind of forced perspective, which again is one of the most tricks, but we were trying to do this in this dinky little roof we talked and talked about what we would put in pots. You know, we were gonna we we're gonna put little succulents in there, or we were gonna put uh, stones. You know, and finally we decided that we would paint them sky blue, so that in a kind of literary way they were reflecting the sky in the way that the mirrors were literally reflecting the sky. So it was a very interesting. And again, we were starting to think in a new way. I remember taking Frank Gehry up to this roof, and he said. You know, these are just kindergarten exercises, but he said, you know, you're on a whole new line of thinking. He said, you should just, you should keep going. So we did. The next one we did was in the grand courtyard at MIT. This is where graduations take place, and you can see from under the dome all the way out to Boston, that's Prudential Center on the other side. And we made a garden. It was made out of these little echo, I don't know whether any of you know the little candies, the little round candies, and they're covered with sugar. And they're pink and, and orange and you know purple, you know, all the sugar colors. And we right across the street from MIT was a factory. It was called the New England Conventionary Company, NECO. And so we went over and sweet talked several boxes of these little discs out of them. And my students and Martha and I went out in the morning and laid out a grid of these discs. And we noticed that the licorice ones, the dark ones, and the chocolate ones weren't reading against the lawn. So we told the students to eat all the chocolate ones and eat all the licorice ones. This used to be, I have a sweet tooth, and this used to be my favorite candy. I always had one beside the bed if I had the urge. I've never had an echo since this garden. I had a lot that way. The other element of it was the spare tires. And the spare tire were painted the same sugary colors that the Neckos. And then we just did it on the edge. We, we twisted one, one square a little different than we could, twisted or than we set up the primary square. And that's all it was. This was on a May day, and they, they were just doing this was just a one day thing. And we thought, well, you know, no real problem with that. But the next day, the campus newspaper came out saying, this outrage has been, you know, put on our campus. And, you know, they had all sorts of things. Students were saying, you know, there are people starving all over the world, and you're putting food out on the, you know, one day of food out on the campus. And I thought, you know, this is really terrible. Uh, and uh, I called Frank and said, you know, landscape architects are supposed to do things that people like, and they love you for it. And he said, no, you're onto something. You should just keep going. So again, we did. Little by little, this idea of flatness crept into our regular work. This is the Nasher Sculpture Garden in Dallas. Renzo Piano is the architect. And this is a one block. This is the Dallas Museum of Art. One block. And you can see from the street out here through Renzo's building and out into the garden. And there's a friend of mine, old Doug Christmas. He's an art dealer in Los Angeles in New York, Ace Gallery. And he told me when we were working on this, he said, you know, if you put a grid in there of trees, the sculptors will love you because they like order and they like to play against order. They need an absolutely flat surface, but they need to have something that's orderly so they can do the disorderly thing and really like you for it. So we didn't put a simple grid, but we put a little more complex grid, a series of trees and a series of bosques that were also in grid form. And when the, when the uh, 
garden opened, um, there were a whole series of sculpture, many of the sculptures that Ray had, he had 600 museum quality sculptures, you could only handle about 23 at any time in the garden. But the sculptors came up and said, you know, this is really great. This is the best place we've ever had to show our sculpture. So Doug was right, and I learned something. And here's what it looks like. These are these rows of trees. We also have edges. You can't outdoor. This is a gallery, not a museum. So they're constantly changing the sculpture. You can't go out and change hedges and move trees every time. So we have a series of elements, the hedges and the rows of trees and the bosques. Uh, which made different size spaces for the different kinds of sculpture that are in there, and they change. We still have the, you know, the great thing about landscape is we still have the changes of seasons, trees changing their color, and there are lots of things that are, that are unique to landscape. But some of these things come right off that roof in uh, Marlboro Roof. Done a lot of work with Hump and Yon, and one of the projects, one of the early projects we did was the uh, Sony Center in Berlin. And this was built, this whole area, this and all of this, was built on top of a basement. And because they're Sony, they had a multiplex movie theater downstairs. And you could see that this was the lobby of the, of the multiplex. And then Helmut put a big roof. It wasn't an air conditioned space, but he put a big tent on top of all of this, and it goes sort of there. And this is a fairly good-sized project. This is the Sony, uh, that's the Sony headquarters. This is another tower. This is the subway system. And then this is a hotel and apartments, and a film house, and a lot of things around this square. For scale, this is about 300 feet from here to here. And it's maybe 180 feet wide, so it's about the size of a football field. Because they had the movie theater down there, they wanted a sign. They wanted somebody something to point down and say, go to the movies. We, we talked them into having a, uh, an opening, a hole in the plaza, and then putting a fountain or a pool that had a glass bottle so that you could look through that and look down into the lobby of the theater, sort of using the landscape to announce the lobby. And using that vertical axis, turning the axis against the axis of the of the uh, plaza, and when you went down into the, went down into the lobby, if you look back, you look through the fountain and up to the tent. Again, if you ever saw that, it would stick in your mind. Again, going back to the Andre thing, and this this was a much more elaborate form of putting those railroad ties across the across the uh, meadow. The next t chance we got was to um, get a competition in Saitama. It's a new town. They can no longer get people in and out of the five centers in Tokyo, even by train. It's just simply too much. And so um, they're building these centers, and they ran a competition for this one. And they were going to do the town square before they built all the stuff around. There was going to be a train station, an arena, high-rise buildings, all kinds of stuff around. And we won this competition. Uh, this is a time of uh, postmodernism. Everybody was doing big swirls and deconstructed this and that. And we did it with a simple grid of trees, an orchard of trees, of zelcomas. And each zelcoma sits over a column in the building. So that's, in a sense, that grid is the same grid as the building. And they have a shopping center down below with restaurants and one thing or another. We have restaurants up in these towers. There's a restaurant up there, one of the trees, one at the ground level, and one below. So each one of these trees sits on top of a column so we can carry the load. The plaza is made of equal parts grill, like a tree grave, and stone, narrow strips. And that allows all the water, the rainwater that hits this plaza, to go right through the plaza, go down, feed the trees, and then drain out below, this level. I think this is the only absolutely flat outdoor plaza in the whole world. This has no pitch on it at all. It got rid of it. I mean, the whole thing is a catch basin. There's no catch basin. You can see this is the dirt level around there. And the trees are growing in that dirt. It's a couple of meters. 
and it's like an ant farm. Let, we let the dirt go right up against the glass. So you could, when you, when you went up and down the escalator or what not, you could look and see what the trees were growing in. It was a, a completely glass building, and you just see the dirt right through the glass. Now, one of the things that we were thinking about when we got this idea of putting things on flat surfaces was that we could then eliminate other things. We didn't need a lot of furniture and decoration and one thing or another. We didn't need shrubbery. We didn't need much of anything. And the idea was that you would make the trees the things. So if you removed enough stuff, then the trees and what they were doing through the years, you know, the winter letting the sun in and then coming on in spring and then heavy leaf in the summer and then uh, coloring up in the fall. So people were using this to come to work. You know, they'd come in on the train, they'd go over to their building, they'd come in on the train, they'd go to the arena, see a, uh, some kind of entertainment. And so as they came through this every single day, it would be a little different every single day. Now in Japan, they have a very strong sense of nature, a poetic sense. Landscape and landscape design, garden design in Japan is up with poetry, sculpture, and music. Architecture is way down below that. Everything, you know, high. So you explain a concept like this to a group, and they all go, oh, yes, I see what you mean. Because their culture is attuned to this. Unfortunately, New York wasn't quite so simple to all explain. But this is sort of what would happen during the year. This is the plaza inside, and here what we did is use these uh, cylinders of, of glass. So they had a, a, a food court below it. And in the daytime, the light would come through this plaza and, and light the food court below. And at nighttime, when they turned on the, when they turned on the lights, it, they would come up and they would light the plaza. So this is the, now these are all kind of minimal moves, but what they, what they mean is that what, where they come from is that you think longer about doing stuff. And you only do things that do several things at once. You can make them very complicated, but you have to do it in, a, in an excruciatingly simple way. So back to my quote name. From about Thanksgiving um, through Christmas, we uh, fax things back and forth, manifestos and designs and one thing or another. And Michael was making models and so forth. And some of these things, because the jury was still sitting, it's gone on for months and months, the jury was still sitting, and he would take them into the jury and try to show them what we were thinking about. And these were, these were models that Michael made. And the jury wasn't completely accepting of this. What did I do? Um, so, I got a call, in fact, I was in Basel. I was working at Novartis, and I got a call about, uh, I don't know, in the afternoon, and he said, the jury wants to talk to us. And I said, well, look, I'm, I'm at Novartis. I have a meeting with the president tomorrow. This is a big job for me. I don't want to, you know, I can't rush out of here. And I said, what about getting them on the phone? How about having a conference on the phone? So they set up a conference at 7 o'clock that night. I don't know whether it was in New York, early in New York. Um, seven o'clock at night, we had this thing, and I, you know, they were asking questions like, you know, can we have a memorial? Does it have to be there? What they really didn't like was this big stone plaza, seven acres of stone with the thing going down. Now that would be very powerful, but it's also pretty brutal. And downtown New York, which is the highest density in the America, maybe not as high as Hong Kong or something, but very, very high, 60, 80 story buildings. 100 story buildings. Um, they needed some public open space. And the mayor said, you know, I, this can't be just a memorial. And again, the question that they were asking was, can you do a memorial and a public open space where neither of those functions compromises the other, where they work together? And I don't know what was going on with the other people who were trying for this, but that turned out to be our mantra. And that's what we were trying to do. This was the first design that we made of it. This is just a little hand sketch that I made. And 
He called up one day, on Tuesday, and said, we think you've won, this is the jury speaking, we think you've won, but we have two provisos. The first one is that neither of you can fire the other one, and neither of you can quit. You have to agree not to quit, and agree not to fire the other person. At the time, I thought that was a pretty simple thing to do. The other thing that they asked was that we could not fuss about these buildings, because we didn't like them. We wanted this whole thing to be clear, and, but we agreed. So they said, fine, we're gonna have our lawyers send out a paper, and you each sign it. So they faxed it over to us, we signed it, sent it back, and we won. One week later, they had planned to have a public announcement. Now, you know, you think you go down to City Hall and somebody stands up and points at the pictures and so forth. But this is for the press of the world. And you go back to the, t the TV business, everybody came. You know, behind the Iron Curtain, all over Europe, all over Asia, everybody was there. TV, the whole thing. I'd never been through anything like this, but for the first part, what we had is we had about seven or eight days make a few renderings. That was why this was made, to make a few renderings and make a model. And this drawing was made at first to be the same scale as the model. And when we went in and they were building the model, the guy didn't have enough trees, got about half the trees that we needed. And Michael said, well, we'll just spread them out. And wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what we're going to do. So we asked the guy to go back, and overnight he doubled the number of trees. And so we put this drawing, this actually has holes in it. <coughs> we put this drawing on top of the model and pushed a tree through every one of those dots, and that became our model. When we, stuck, when we went to the, uh, uh, in front of all the press, um, Michael's father, who, who was an ambassador to America from Israel, uh, had a public relations firm that he used and that was very bright woman come and talk to us about uh, you know, how we could handle it. She said, here's what you do. You each write a paragraph, maybe a paragraph and a half. And no matter what anyone asks you, answer one of those paragraphs. Just answer it back. I said, you gotta be kidding. You know, these are smart people. She said, just do it. So we went on the Today Show, we went on everything, and we did it. We, we, we answered our same uh, paragraphs, no matter what the hell, and nobody cared. It was wonderful. <laughs> So then the question is, well, could any of these ideas actually, could we really have a design? We had an idea, but no, no real design and no scale. So we went back and we built a model. It's an eight-scale model. And the reason we needed it was because these boys, to have their most impact, had to come out of a perfectly flat plane. And we, we put trees above it, but you were going to be below the trees. And when you look through, you had to be able to see it as flat to get the maximum impact of the board. Put things in it and then took things out. We saw how many things you could have under there and still have this perfectly flat surface. So that's what, that's what this was all about. <laughs> One of the ideas that we had had that sort of grew out of this mad flurry was that we would plant the trees in a very special way. If you were entering the plaza from the, from the south or from the north, you would come in and see the woods would have no order irregularly. And then, like an abacus, you know, the, the, you know, the beads are like this, but the beads are in straight lines, but they're all irregular. And then you turn 90 degrees and look the other way, and they were turned into Gothic uh, colonnades. So you'd have this thing working when you were inside, getting one view one way and then one view the other way. And, and we didn't know whether that would work, so we made a big model and try to see whether that would work, and, and it did. The next thing that came up was that the engineers, uh, the engineers came to us and said, look, below you is seven stories of stuff. It's a shopping center, chiller plant, parking garage, seven stories of stuff beneath you. And we have to get air down to all those things and then we have to take exhaust from all those things back up. And there were going to be 17 of these towers. And the towers had to be 40 feet high. 
because they were afraid of somebody throwing a hand grenade down and been terribly worried about security. They were afraid of somebody throwing a hand grenade down one of these towers. That would have been the end of it, as far as I was concerned. There goes flat. They're not going to have any flat with all these towers. So we made this model. We call it the awful model. And we made this model and painted all these things bright orange. And we took it to the governor. who's the only one that had enough power to deal with it. And we showed it to the governor. We said, this is the development. This is where this thing is going. He said, that looks awful. That's the reason we call it the awful model. And so he turns to the, to the engineers in the Port Authority, of which there were dozens and dozens, but maybe only eight or nine at the meeting. And he says to them, this is terrible. We've got to get rid of this. And the engineer sort of stood on one foot and then the other and said, well, sir, you know, I think we could, you know, we could get rid of a couple of them. And then we could have artists decorate the rest of them and everything would be okay. And God bless them, the governor said, no, no, get rid of all. So they rerouted everything to a couple of buildings over here. And all of these were gone. That was a huge victory. That would have, I think, been the end of this design anyway. We would have had to come up with something else. And that often happens in a, you know, in a scheme. The next thing were the trees, because we had this notion that this was going to be made of a canopy and columns and then a flat surface. The governor wanted us to uh, find the trees in New York State and the five states around, because, because the transportation system is so good in New York, people were commuting in to the, to the towers. And most of the people who had been killed were from these five states. So we went out to the nurseries. We have a forester named Paul Cowley, a great guy. And our staff scoured the countryside. And we got them in people's backyards. We were given a few trees uh, from some of the public works departments. I think in Maryland, they gave us 20 or 30 trees that they had sitting by. And we were, in New York, there are only about five trees that you can plant that aren't um, Attack, being attacked by some kind of disease or bug or something. And the only one that, that eliminated red oaks, all the maples, all the plane trees, all the things you would normally make a grid out of. And we ended up with these white swamp oaks. And that was the most uh, resistant of all of the trees on their list. There only about five. It sounds ridiculous, but you know, in New York, the lifespan of a tree on Manhattan Island is 10 years. They die on average one, you know, you die one, one every 10 years, so you've got a complete um, change of trees. Now, that doesn't mean every tree dies, but the number of trees that die are really important. We were trying to build this for 80, 100, 110 years. This is to build for the ages. And so we had to find these trees. And they did find them. They found we, we needed about 425, and we, we tried to get about a little over 500, because we knew we were going to lose some in construction, one thing or another. And we collected them all and put them in these boxes and put them over in a nursery in New Jersey, which is about the same distance from the river that the memorial is on, that, on the opposite side, on the Manhattan side. And we called a, a, a firm of tree experts from Chicago, great people. And they put, like you know, when you go into the hospital, they put ingredients, you know, into you so they feed you, you don't have to swallow or anything. And they put uh, uh, all sorts of things in those, in those. They did it in the trees. They put an intravenous thing in every single tree. And they starved the big ones, and they fed the little ones. They all looked about the same, but they were these different sizes. Three years later, they were all exactly the same size. And they were as good, almost as good as the Zelkova group that we had in Japan. I mean, they were really, really good. And they looked like this. We had one tree that was saved from the disaster. Everything came down and piled on top of it. And they dug it out, a little pear tree in it. Was, it wasn't dead. And they took it up to the northern end of the island and nursed it for 10 years. And they call it the survivor tree, and they brought it back. And one of the ironies is it came back, and when we first put the, all the trees in, this was the tallest tree in the whole bunch, including all these oaks. 
The other reason we wanted the Elks is we wanted them to uh, branch out and to make a kind of Gothic arch. And our reference point was the original building. This is Yamasaki, one of the towers, Yamasaki Towers. And you can see there's a kind of Gothic detail on the top. And so we used this to sort of sell the trees and connect it to the site. New York is not Japan. I mentioned this before. And they're a tougher sell. New Yorkers have lived in an environment with almost no trees so long that they don't know anything about them, though they all love trees. They all have a tree in their backyard that isn't working, and they hate that tree. And so there's always this thing. I, I made, I don't know, dozens of, of meetings, and we made these drawings uh, to try and show them how interesting it was in the spring, and how different it was in the summer, and in the fall, and then in the winter where you just have a tracery, and you, in the falls, or in the winters, the only time you'll see these buildings that are all the way around. And that would be interesting. People will like that and will enjoy that. And we, finally, we finally sold this to everyone. Keep doing that. So then how to keep the trees alive? We found them because we've grown them, but how do we keep them alive? So basically what we did is, is build a series of trenches like this. And some of the trenches you could walk in, there's one cross-section of one you can walk in, so the crouch down, it's about six feet. And then there's a and then there's a trough of dirt that goes all the way across the memorial. So you, you generally think in a roof garden, you know, a thousand square feet per tree, this way we could triple that. And so this, uh, this dirt is a kind of linear trench that the trees are grown in. And then the trees are at a high point and the low point, is, it looks flat, but it actually is slightly doing that. And the water is going from the high point down here, and this is a drain, and it drains down through that, and is taken all the way down seven stories to these huge tanks, and collected and kept and cleaned down there. And that's done in the spring, when the, when the snow melts and the rains come. And then in the late July and, and August, we pump that water back up, and that's used for the irrigation. So we have a cycle which is working about, I mean, it's mechanical, but it works very much the way the earth works. It goes down to the aquifer, and then you pump it back up and use it again and again. And once you've pumped it up and irrigated it, it, it again goes down, again is caught along with that from the spring. So it, in a sense, it's a replenishing system. And that's the system we've been planting the trees in. And the test of that is that we were putting trees in over six years. And the trees, we planted 40 or 50 the first year. And those trees, by the time we planted the last trees, were double the size of the ones that came in from the nursery last. So in that six years, they were, they were doubling their size. and went from something like this or something like this. So the system was working. Maybe too fast. We're not, we're not worried. Or we're, we're a little worried about that. It may be that we're going to have to ask the tree experts to come in and flow the process down. We'll see. The waterfall was another problem. We've done some waterfalls, but if you think of it, each of these boards is 200 feet on the side. It's not an acre. So if you have a waterfall that goes around each one, and you have two of them, you have 1,600 feet of waterfall. That's a lot of water. And if you drop water 30 feet down, you need a weir that's maybe three quarters of, that takes three quarters of an inch, an inch of water across the weir. Now, it doesn't take any energy when it falls, but it takes a hell of a lot of energy to get it back up fast enough to fall again. And the predictions are if we had three quarters of an inch or an inch of water across there, it might cost as much as $50 million for the electric bill. That would have broken the bank, couldn't do it. So uh, Dan User, who's our fountain designer, fantastic guy, designed a weir that was like a cone. So the water was broken into a whole series of small jets. And that, even though it makes something that looks like, you know, a waterfall, it um, uses about a tenth the amount of water. 
which is just a little under $5 million a year. We could afford that. We could, we could make that work. I know these numbers sound big, but $50 million is bigger than $5 million. And uh, that wouldn't have worked. So Dan saved the project, because that again, like, the, like the, the towers going up, this would have called it to a halt. And I don't know, we didn't have an idea to, to change that. You can see Dan up here, this is a mock-up he did just outside of Toronto. You can see him down here working on this, and that was the room behind. We got rid of the room for a lot of reasons. One of them was security. They decided not to have people go down. But the other was because if you stood in this room, you got something wet. Everybody, everybody who came to Memorial would have to wear a raincoat. So we decided that was not a good idea. We mocked up everything. We mocked up the stone. This is, this is the stone patterning that we finally arrived at. This is uh, drawn in chalk on our parking lot out in front of our office. We mocked up benches. I think we did 13 benches over the course of three days. We made light fixtures uh, like this. Uh, Paul Morantz is our lighting expert. These lights have a camera right here. And that's all the security you need. That covers, because these lights are everywhere, that covers the whole uh, <coughs> memorial ground, seven acres. We even uh, found a uh, uh, trash basket that wouldn't explode. You could put a bomb in it and it would not explode. We bought it, we were going to get it in Israel. They had developed this thing. Amazing, amazing thing. I mean, this has taken us many funny ways. This was the mock-up of the stone. You see the two sizes. And these, these are pictures of us picking the stone in Berkeley. So the design was done. Everyone agreed. It was a long haul. It was about four or five years in. One of the other notions that we had is that um, it's a little like an Escher. About half of the plaza is stone, and about half of the plaza is vegetable material, vegetation. Mostly grass and ground cover. <clears throat> so some places you would look one way, and you would get an image something like this. And you'd look the other way, and you'd get an image that was hard. So it was about half looking like a plaza, and half looking like a park. Again, going back to that thing of trying to do two separate jobs with the same scheme. This is where we were on opening day. The politicians decided that they couldn't wait longer than 10 years to have the big opening. Part of it was the mayor was going out of, out of office. Um, part of it was uh, they just thought the public wouldn't stand for it. And the only problem with that is that here's where we were on that day of opening. No trees around here, no streets in, no steps in. I was really terrified. It was bad opening night, because I around all around this thing was a cacophony of cranes and trucks that just, you know, it was a construction site. We're right in the middle of the biggest construction site in New York City, maybe the largest construction site they'd seen uh, since Rockefeller Center. And I was afraid people walking in here, there would be no quiet. And this is all, if you think about it, this is all about quiet. The park's about quiet, but the memorial's really about quiet. The details really were beautiful. They were very minimal. These are, these are the benches, stone benches. These are the grates, the pavement, how pieces fit together. The contractors, the stone contractors, all of them have done a wonderful job. About half the people that worked on this job were people who were New Yorkers who either knew or were or related to people who had been killed. I and mean, this was a labor of love. And we had thousands of guys working there. And they were, you know, really doing a careful job. The contractors, everybody pulled together. It was an extraordinary experience from that standpoint. So they opened it up. And the, the opening day, the rule was that you could have uh, anyone who, who was in a family of survivors of a, someone who was killed, or any friend of the person who was killed, cousins, good friends, all of that. Now, there were about 10,000 people in the families, but there were 30,000 people who came in the first day. 
again, I was sort of petrified. I was petrified about their, the way they felt, would feel about it, but I was also petrified that they just trample it. I mean, it was a, you know, it's like you, t I don't know whether any of you are, have had this experience where you tell a football coach that you can't play football on that field for a one year until the, the roots established, and of course they all play football the day after the lawn is in. I thought this thing would just be torn up, but it wasn't. Everybody was really careful. And let's put it next thing. The following day, they started letting in 2,000 people an hour, which is quite a lot smaller crowd and easier for them to say, even though the thing is half the size, even that it will be, or would be, um, it still was a fair number of people. Um, I don't know every one of the family members of, you know, of, the, of the victims, but over the 10 or 12 years we've been working on this thing, um, I've met a lot of them. They served on committees. Some of them have been outspoken, they you were know, making statements to the press and so forth. There was a mixed group. I mean, you can't find 10,000 people where they all agree on anything. So I was somewhat concerned about the families, and the families were important. Some of the members, the people that I knew who came up, who knew me, came up and said, you know, this is really great. We like it. It's very much like, you know, if you're an architect and you're invited over to dinner to the house that you just designed and had built, and the uh, husband and wife really like the house, and they tell you how much they enjoy the view and how much how great the kitchen is and so forth. Well, this was like about a hundred times more than that when these people were coming and giving us a kind of thumbs up. I mentioned Paul Morantz. Paul did a lighting scheme. The lights are up in the trees, so they light the lower uh, leaves. I mean, we had control because we just kept at it, we had control of a lot of things. Paul did a beautiful job on the, uh, on the fountain itself. Um, when they when they move the uh, when they move the uh, names up to the parapet from down below, Michael was really you, know, you can imagine. I mean, that was sort of half his scheme, and he lost it. Actually, he heard about it reading it in the New York Times. That, politicians just sort of publish it so there was no argument about it. And he really felt terrible. And the mayor then came to me and said, well, look, Michael, this is a very complicated thing of how the names go. Which tower were you in? Who were your friends? Were you in the police or the fire and so forth? I think it was a dirty thing to do, but he said, Michael, why don't you work with all these people and get a system that satisfies them all? Pretty clever guy, the mayor. But Michael did. And for three years, he worked with the families and the various people and, and I don't know how many of you have been there, but it really does work very well. I mean, he did a terrific job on that. We went through our first fall, even though the trees were rather small, it was kind of beautiful. And then, of course, the nighttime effects were really terrific. Now, this is the way it looks now. This was this, was this, fall, uh, this summer, and the last tree had been placed. David Walker, who you heard talk about the park in Sydney uh, last time, last semester, I guess, um, he took these pictures. You can see how big the trees are now. They're really growing. And everything is, is going pretty well. It looks quite gorgeous. Even though everything is flat, it's full. It has a kind of feeling of, of health. Now, when they moved the names up, you no longer came out of the, of the tomb and saw the sky. So what you do is you walk across underneath the trees and you walk to the void. You see the names, you look down into the void. And then you turn around and walk back through the trees. So the trees have become the symbol of life. You know, you look at the abyss and then you, and then you come out the other way. And many people have written about how the role that the trees play in the story of the Mamona, in the way you see it in the processional. And so they have really worked. Now you're seeing that the trees are almost touching. We're about ready to take them up another five feet because these steps could be a little higher. And more importantly, all the buildings around the outside have pretty much disappeared. The trees have blocked them out, including the Calatrava, you know, big bird that's sitting across the way. So 
When you get in there, you're inside a place and you're away from the city. And when you walk out, you walk and the city is quieter and the city is away from you. You don't see the moving cars and so forth. And then you walk out again and you walk back into the city, into the live city. Another thing that happened to us, as I said, uh, Michael did this great job on the names. I think they really work. <clears throat> the waterfall really works. But one thing we didn't realize is that people would come and leave momentums. Uh, momentums. I, it was funny because we should have known it. You know, the Vietnam Memorial, they leave these things. They leave medals, they leave little um, notes. And they actually have a warehouse that all the uh, non-perishable stuff that comes off that, they're, they're sorting away and keeping a file. And they have some of it in the museum so you can get a sense of what, what was there. But we didn't expect this. And it was you know, really, really quite nice. It was a level of human quality that the memorial really doesn't have. And I think is, is uh, important to it. On opening day, uh, the first one in was the president. He walks across, he walks under the trees, he walks through the void, looks at the name, looks down. In a sense, we saw this on television, in a sense he was walking for all of us. He was doing the procession that everyone who goes there will do. And um, it was quite moving. It had been a long haul, but it, it was really quite moving. And then he turned around and walked back underneath the trees, out through the memorial, got in his limousine that has these these doors that are about this thick, you can't fire a cannon through it. And it goes to Trump, you know, through a really big car, and he drove away. But from my point of view, and that was a big thing when he was there, and everybody was there, all the ex-presidents, everyone, all the ambassadors, senators, Hillary was there, everybody. But from my point of view, our real client, we had 27 agencies that reviewed this thing. And they all reviewed it from their own point of view. They all tried to impose their own values on each thing. We got to kind of fight our way through it. was broken field running. But in the final analysis, most of us felt we were working for the families. That the closure of the families was really the most important thing that we, that we were attempting to do. And in succeeding that, we thought that we'd probably done about as good a job as we could. Thank you.